Thank you, Muki. Um, welcome, everybody, also from my side. Um, as said, my name is Inkan Braunschmidt. I'm driving Heimer's um, innovation and digital journey um, mm -hmm. across, um, for Heimer itself and all its 42 companies. Heimer itself is a group of life-saving technology companies, and we provide innovative solutions to many of the key problems facing the world today. Our purpose is to, set, is to grow safer, cleaner, and healthier future for everyone, every day. And to achieve this, what we call is our North Star, we need a lot of things to do. Uh, but one very important point is we need to keep innovating. And to achieve this purpose, we need also to go digital. So one of um, Hammer's strategic focus areas is um, supporting our companies to make their products and technologies connected and smart. And if you have done that, you can crunch the data to solve customer problems, and in some cases, then moving to data and insights-driven um, business models where you can then not just monitor, but predict and prevent um, whatever you want to do there. However, um, our companies are all at a very different stage of that innovation and digital journey and strategic partnerships uh, can provide additional technologies and capabilities as well as helping to accelerate market access. And to this extent, partnerships are hugely beneficial to us. Partnerships with big companies, small companies and also partnerships with startups. But why should startups um, like Oxpotica work with a big corporate like Halma, or in this case specifically with Navtech, who is one of our subsidiaries? In this panel, we want to show you the benefits of a corporate um, supporting a startup partnership. So Halma PLC, the mother company of Navtech, a company who is working with a startup, Navtech, uh, who is an expert in radar technology, and the startup which is Oxpotica, an AI software and platform company from Oxford. And Navtec has this strategic partnership with Oxpotica and Halma invested in the last round of Oxpotica. Before we go into the details of this, um, uh, of this great partnership, I just want to share with you some success factors, but also some do's and don'ts of strategic partnerships. And I assume we had some slides for the background, but they might not be available. And in very short, for corporations, partnering with startups can be one strategic pillar of their innovation strategy. And for startups, corporates could be the key to unlock new revenue and scaling opportunities. Also, of course, you can combine these strategic partnerships between bigger companies and a startup with um, venture, venturing on corporate venturing. Um, you, you can do that, but you don't have to. In, in our case of, of Navtec and Oxbotica, it's a strategic partnership and we invested, but it's also possible to build a good strategic partnership without venturing. Some of you might think now, hmm, uh, the most of natural partners, a corporate and a startup might not be, but there are a number of reasons why startups and corporates can be a very great match. Let me start with reason number one. Startups can help corporates speed up innovation. So the most innovative corporations in the world are the ones willing to collaborate um, with bigger and smaller companies and startups. And this is based on an understanding that new and emerging technology is out there. I don't need to invent all that technology myself and sometimes it's even on our doorstep. So why should I as a corporate invent the wheel again? So for corporates, it's really being outward oriented, open minded, that innovation not always happens in your own labs, but it happens out there. And for startups, it's important to check how open an experience a corporate is to work with. Um, and of course, the other way around. A second good reason um, why these two should collaborate is startups can prove their solutions and their ability to scale. So having a commercial contract with a corporate, whether it's a pilot, a proof of concept, a longer term relationship, doesn't matter. It's very powerful and it's a sign for the stakeholders of the startup that the startup is able or capable to work with, with a bigger partner. And this partnering can also prove that uh, for other investors um, that an early stage business got a mature management, and sophistication of technology to work with uh, another company or with a larger corporate. And therefore, the startup is likely maybe to receive further investment. 
based on that collaboration. A third good reason why corporates and startups should work together, startups can help change mindset of corporates. So by collaborating, um, corporates um, can open up themselves, of course, to new opportunities and ideas, but at the same time, they also can experience new way of working, maybe get more agile. Um, for that, corporates um, can shift their um, mindset, um, but this change in mindset has also become really a centerpiece why many corporates in nowadays want to work um, with startups. For startups, it's important to have a look um, how far is the big company already with that. Otherwise, it might, might be not that good of match if mindset are too far away. But if the corporate is open and willing to change that, then this is good news. At HANA, for example, we have built a startup ecosystem um, in London, uh, but also in Tel Aviv and Israel to really get close to um, startups and have access to opportunities to get to know each other and work with each other. And we are some accelerators we have built. We bring companies together. That could be our own companies, but also our companies then with external partners and, and startups to generate new ideas um, or new business models. The fourth good reasons, uh, reason why startups and for, uh, corporates should work together um, corporates can share their reach, their experience, their resources. So working with a corporate can immediately give benefits to a startup if the corporate really opens up their markets, customer base, resources or logistics, manufacturing, whatever it is which could be beneficial. It could be also combining technologies to generate convergence opportunities and that was the case here with Snaftech and Oxbotica. So um, Navtech um, brought its radar expertise into that partnership and Oxbotica its AI expertise to the table. And so together they created um, one of the world's best localization systems, a convergence opportunity which would not have been there without each other. In the second part, I shortly want to share with you a handful of lessons learned. So. Um, in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years, um, I, I've made experience when it really worked good and also when it was going south. So one of the lessons learned for both, um, know exactly what and who you're partnering with. Um, so nothing can replace, of course, getting to know each other in person, but we do know difficult in these times. So whatever we can do via online and, and exchange and getting to know each other, we should do. But a corporate also needs to be aware why startups very often have a shiny pitch deck, so great pitch deck, and a shiny brochure. Um, they might not be able to deliver what they promise in these brochures yet. And the same is true the other way around. A startup should have a look and do a bit of a due diligence if the corporate um, has experience in working with startups. What's the track record? So both should do that bit of due diligence before getting together. A second lessons learned, make sure both sides know and are aware of what they really want from that partnership. So the, the startup of course needs to make clear what it wants from the deal and from that partnership. If it's only money, then yes, maybe if the corporate has a venture capital fund, then this is possible as well. But maybe a startup then rather is, is better off with a, with a, with a VC, a uh, classical VC, if it's only about money because there's so much more a uh, strategic partner can give you. The other way around is also important. If a corporate um, goes into a strategic partnership, what is it exactly that they want to do together and not just invest in a lot of startups and then nothing ever um, happened there. A third lesson learned, make decisions fast. And that's for the corporates because um, uh, the timing of large corporations very often doesn't fit for startups. Um, in some corporates, decisions can take some weeks to make, and that's a century for a startup. There in a startup, decisions are made in an hour or in a day. So timing is particularly crucial when it comes to being paid. So whatever money needs to flow, it can be a matter of life and death for a, a startup if the money comes tomorrow, or next month, or in two months. So it, it, that is a problem for startups. And to change this and make it either, um, corporate should think about easier contracts um, uh, with um, startups so that um, 
without large administrative um, hassle on both sides, a partnership, partnership can work. A fourth lessons learned, both should be ready to share. Whatever the partnership is about, but you need to share some of your experience, your wisdom, your ideas, and if it's a development partnership, of course, also your IP. What's not working, if a corporate is very secretive and um, doesn't want to share anything, then uh, that's difficult for the startup, but of course also the other, other way around. If, if none of both is open enough, then this will not work. Last lessons learned, and that's again for the corporate, don't squeeze too hard. So one of the biggest mistakes um, is to treat a startup partner just as another supplier or as other bigger partners. And that might be tempting for some big corporates um, to throw its, throw its weight around, but um, there, there's no benefit in negotiating a captured deal with a startup um, because um, if a startup goes dead or bankrupt, then there is no value in that partnership anyhow anymore. There are many more lessons learned. I'm, I'm sure that that were just five I want to give you um, uh, with you for today's session. Um, we will hear much more about a very successful partnership between Naftec and Expotica. And at this stage, I would like to introduce our company, Naftec Radar who specializes in performance radar technology. And Maftec partnered with Oxbotica, who is a leading startup in autonomous vehicle software and AI. And together, they created a world-first off-the-shelf solution that integrates into any autonomy stack, operating entirely independent, um, and so does not need any GNS or GPS. And this is a good example of where both parties, the corporate and the startup, really benefit from this partnership by providing each other their unique capabilities. That you get an idea of what we are talking about, we have prepared for you a little video, um, which I want to show you. So can we have the video, please? Thank you. With me here now in the panel, um, I have Phil Avery, who is the founder and managing director of Naftec Radar. Hi, Phil. Morning. And I have Paul Newman, who is a co-founder and the CTO at Oxbotica. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Great to have you both um, in this panel. I would like to start um, the panel discussion. And uh, by the way, the audience can also ask questions, and I will try to come and pick some of them later um, during this panel, so please ask questions. But I have a first question to Phil. How did the partnership between Naftec and Oxbotica first start? Uh, Paul and I actually met at the University of Sydney uh, oh, over 20 years ago now. I, I was working on a um, autonomous vehicle project then using very early stage radar prototypes. Um, and Paul was uh, doing, some, uh, doing his PhD, I think it was uh, underwater um, autonomy, Paul, if I recall correctly, and actually, interestingly, one area where you don't do any of that work at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's where we met. Uh, we stayed in touch. Uh, I, I left um, Australia to set up Navtech back in the UK. I think Paul went to, uh, over to the States at that time, did various other things. Um, and then about, it must have been a good 10 years after that, uh, Paul moved to Oxford to set up a, a uh, robotics um uh, mobile robotics group uh, for doing research there and um, actually uh, Navtech was based in Oxfordshire where we had uh, since leaving the university had developed a um, an industrial grade radar system uh, for uh, industrial applications obviously mainly in autonomy and also in things like perception so yeah we, we kept in touch over that period of time obviously shared interest starting roughly the same area and then um, continue to talk over the uh, the following 10 years on how we could actually take the, our technology with, with Paul's technology um, and uh, make a combined system. And, and that's come to fruition over the last um, couple of years. Yeah, thank you for that. 10 years and another 10 years. So, Paul, what took you so long? Or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 
<laughs> I that question. It's either like it was really hard or, you know, I was sitting in front of me for 20 years. I don't know if that makes me really good or really bad at it. Uh, you know, what, what took so long? I mean, I think I think there's an evolution of, of this technology for, you know, um, so we work with computer vision and we work with, with laser as well, but there's something really quite quite unique about about radar uh and in particularly that the the, the radar that, that navtech uh, make in that um i think you can you can do it wrong you can try and make radar look like a laser and it's just not and you know that because it's not a laser it has a completely different modality and so the the the, the change in thinking that we did was instead of trying to make the sensor look like something it wasn't trying to make it look like a a lidar uh, embrace it for what it is uh and it's a gloriously rich sensor that gives you remarkably complex returns. Flip the mathematics around to try and include as much data as possible, and you suddenly have something that works really quite extraordinary. So uh, it's one of those really lovely journeys. I mean, I remember when I first came back from MIT, you know, working with that radar and thinking it was like drinking from a fire hydrant with gravel in the flow, through to actually, well, actually, that was where the information was. Um, and then with Oxford in the past few years, we've really taken that technology forward. Um, uh, I made it work on very, very low um, power processors, you know, uh, of the order of one watt. Um, it's been a great journey, um, you know, and Oxbodica makes software. We don't make hardware. Um, Navtech make fantastic hardware, and we're right next to each other in this ecosystem. And then with Halmar, supercharging it is the mothership behind, you know, the, the um, you know, the stamp of approval you get from DD for investment with Halmar, standing for safety, um, it's it's been an extraordinary partnership and um, doing great things now. Wait till what happens over the next twelve months. Oh my! Yeah, I want to go later um, in that uh, during that session a bit in detail of the partnership. So, but um, Paul, um, the Terran three hundred and sixty. So, is the result really of Navtech's high resolution radar combined yeah. with Spartacus world leading autonomous vehicle software? And um, tell us a bit more about um, the journey developing this solution. Specifically, if you think about the trials you did to, to get to the point when yeah. you realized it really worked. Yeah. So, just ten seconds on on what we've made. So, um, we have a, a product here that tells you where you are, anywhere. Uh, in, in any environment on any vehicle, whether a human could see through a dust cloud, you know, underground, in a forest, in a city, um, without any dependence on GPS at, at, at any time. Um, and, uh, you know, so so we knew that this has worked um, and we were confident, but, you know, the, the, you know, when you go out there, it gets pretty, it gets pretty interesting. So where have we tried it for? We tried it on the front of a train and we've done a proof of value on the front of a train at 120 kilometers an hour. We've done it down mines. Um, we've gone through forests, we've done a lot of maritime um, and harbour work as well. And I think that's the glorious thing about the sensor, it's an industrial sensor. So, you know, whatever the environment throws at it, that's fine, it just sees, just sees through it. Um, and us having that software tucked inside that sensor, um, it, it's, been, it's been extraordinary. I mean, I was, I was surprised how well it worked on the train at 120 miles an hour, um, and also on huge ocean going ships as well. Um, and for mining, for I mean, I think the huge play for autonomy coming, it's not robo taxis, it's industrial autonomy, right? And, and we've got a first in the world product here targeted at what's hard about industrial autonomy. I mean, you know, we ran this in the middle of an oil refinery, um, with with BP, where there's so many reflectors and pipes and things that can blow up uh, around it, where safety is so important and knowing where you are to a few centimeters, where no GPS is required, um, is is I think an extraordinary yeah. uh, proof of value. I also thought that it was interesting. You tested it on Iceland, so sub zero temperatures and against other <laughs> sensors. <laughs> that is, I think one of the hardest environment you you can start testing such a solution and then we really are true to yourself if what you are claiming is true and and you just said it now now twice and i just want to make sure so it really does not rely on any gps correct it doesn't so um here's how it works um you put your radar on your vehicle you move the vehicle through the environment for the first time so it builds a memory of what that environment is and then you can run through that and it'll tell you where you are in that environment. Now, if you wanted to say, oh, but I actually want output of this thing in GPS coordinates, then you might want to record some GPS at the same time, but it does not require GPS to work. In fact, none of the Oxbodica vehicles require GPS to work at all. Um, I think that's really important on account of there is no GPS underground or in a forest or you know in cities where it's jammed. Now, you can use it if you want, but there's no requirement for it. And we're getting about 
Well, I've got better this morning, actually, but you know, we're getting off the order of a few centimeters of, of error on that thing. Yeah. Well, thank you. I want to switch a bit to um, Phil. Um, lots of people might claim, of course, that their product is new and totally different than the best in the world. Can you tell us a bit why this solution is different to everything else on the market? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, firstly, it's based it's based on radar. Very few lo localization systems are. In fact, I don't know of any um, that are based on radar. Um, so that, that that that's one thing. And the reason why our radar, we we believe, and, and obviously uh, with our partnership with Oxbotica, they share this view is better than most is we specifically developed it for industrial applications ground-based industrial applications where high resolution um uh imaging is required so uh the range resolution the angular resolution the beam width is all at a level which is much higher than most products on the market so it's not comparable with a say for example a marine radar or an aerospace radar um, so, so that so that's one thing, and then of course you take the fact that it's radar technology, um, and that gives it its all weather, all environment capabilities. So it, it is a difficult sensor to work with. I think that's where uh, Oxbotica have, uh, have managed to get the best out of it. But you do have that high resolution data, which is superior to most radar systems, um, and you have very rich data as well, um, and that comes from the way the radar is designed. So combine all those things together, and you have a you have a solution which is yeah, is not is not available elsewhere. Um, and you know, yeah, it has taken a while to, to to come to come up with a solution, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a combination of all those things that make it unique. So you do have already, as I know, um, pilot customers, um, you have done test trials. Where do you see this new technology being deployed? What benefit will it bring to industry? What proof of concept have you already carried out? You, you and Paul mentioned in some yeah. slides, this is some examples, but could you give us a bit more flavor? Sure, yeah. So Paul mentioned uh, a few there. So we have tried it on mining vehicles of different types, um, underground mining vehicles, uh, 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 above ground mining vehicles. We put it on boats um, in, uh, uh, in estuaries in um, uh, sort of large rivers. We put it on trains. Uh, we put it on vehicles in, in uh, um, ice fields in Iceland. Uh, so I think the thing that is worth noting here is that each of those environments is very different. So if you take, for example, a train traveling at uh, 120 miles an hour in a na effectively a narrow corridor, there you have objects moving past the train at relatively short distances. So it's a, red, it's a long range sensor uh, looking out to several hundred meters. But in that environment, you're looking at the uh, the edges of the uh, of the the train track and the and the embankments and things like that. Then when you're getting data from that, so the train's moving very fast short distance you then look at uh, another application for example with a with a boat moving in an estuary there the boat tends to move very slowly maybe five knots something like that your objects you're using for localization are a couple of hundred meters away um, and they're moving very slowly so so they're the sort of two extremes and we we've, we've done everything in between so these are actual proof of concepts where we've proved the system to work we've proved the reliability and we've also proved the the, the accuracy of the solution so um, and we look forward to doing many more as well that we uh, um, so do a short answer to your question would be where do we see it being used pretty much everywhere except under under the sea where Paul started and um, so I think people might have now recognized it's really an industrial grade compact solution and it requires only a single sensor for accurate and reliable location. How long does it take to um, install it and is it compatible to any other systems? Um, just thinking about some of the use cases you have where mm. your solution would get into an environment of other sensors and systems. Can you talk about how easy or difficult it is to integrate your solution in and you can use an example again. Yeah, it's, it, it's extremely easy. Um, uh, it effectively provides similar data output to a, to a, to a GPS. You know, obviously it's not a GPS, but very similar data output. Once the system has learned the environment, then it just provides the XY um, uh, data. It's, it's on an Ethernet connection, like most uh, uh, sensors nowadays. Uh, so it's extremely simple. We, we, we have uh, demonstrated this, and we've had this feedback from our POC customers that have taken the system, put it on their um, uh, vehicle, whatever it may be. Um, it's very compact physically as well. It's very low power. So all these all these simple things that, that people overlook. Yeah, so it's a 20-watt sensor. It runs off 24 volts. 
it's about this big. I can't see both my hands. Uh, so uh, yeah, from every aspect of it is very simple, and the actual um, software integration is also very simple as well. So yeah, any, anyone wishing to use it um, uh, can integrate it very quickly. Very good. Um, a question to both of you, Phil and Paul, and then I will have a look what uh, questions we might have from the audience. What made this partnership a success so far, assuming it is a success, but Paul, you said it at the beginning. And are there any learnings um, for, for the audience? But first, what made it a success? I think I think there, it's a triumvirate. There are three parties here, and I think that's extremely important. There's the, the backing and encouragement of Halmar. Um, there's the route to market through NavTech for us as a software business that's extremely important. NavTech being an established, respected player in this market. Um, there's the speed at which we can innovate and um, the algorithmic stuff that we can do. And then at the look at the heart of that is there's a people relationship here. And I would, you know, thinking about partnerships is, you know, uh, engineering great humans are engineers having that relationship with the businesses when we're we're planning what we're going to do we're planning the recycle um the, the release cycle when we're open about when there are hitches open about where it's not working as we thought it would what are we going to do it is so important not to have those sort of tense boundaries between businesses and there's a shared vision and, and we spent a long time making sure we were absolutely aligned on why this product in those sectors that we are challenging really is unique and all the staff and the businesses are aligned on that. It's 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 really, really important. So we haven't seen any sort of misalignment because you know if you're aligned misaligned by 10 degrees at the start, after two years, that's gonna be a big distance. And and have you built the relationships in the businesses that can keep the feedback going between them? Um, are there many, many is it a bow tie relationship that's between through Phil and I, or is it actually a great surface between the two businesses where there are multiple um, individuals that are working together? It has to be the latter to be robust. Yes. Yeah. Phil, anything to anything to add um, to what Paul said? Yeah, I, I would I would say that I, th I think you know, that that those relationships allow you to share ideas um, and uh, allow you to explore what could be possible before it is possible. Because I think it would be fair to say, Paul, if we try to do it ten years ago, back to that ten years time frame, the processing power. Well, firstly, technology wasn't there, the understanding wasn't there, the processing power wasn't there. It was clear, interestingly, that that if you look at raw radar data, which we in NavTech spend a lot of time doing. There's a huge amount of information there. <clears throat> and I suppose it's those discussions with Paul some time ago saying, well, look, you know, we can see stuff. You, you go, yeah, but how do you actually interpret that? So, so sort of seeding those ideas uh, well in advance, potentially well in advance of, of, of uh, um, them it being possible to actually use the data um, because of limitations of technology or understanding, then those relationships um, do create that opportunity, even if it takes a little bit of a while to get going. Uh, and you never know when, it, when it's going to come. You know, maybe something doesn't come of it, but, but actually if you keep having the conversations, then you always increase the probability that at some point someone will go, actually, that's a really good idea. I think we can do something with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think observing it from the outside, there's definitely also a trust which established in the relationship between, of course, both of you guys, but then also with your teams, which definitely helps if they're... Yeah, yeah, yeah very much yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I, I want to switch now to some of the questions from the audience. And uh, a first one is, a lot of autonomous vehicle software tools seem to use reinforcement to train. Is that the case here? No. Paul? Oh, no, 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 it doesn't. No, um, oh, and I think one of the strengths of this thing is that we, you know, we can lift this thing uh, from an environment that we've been working in. I don't know, I don't know, pick um, off-roading in a mine uh, and run it in a forest or run it in a port with no parameter changes at all. Yeah, yeah. so it has to be robust in that sense. I mean, you, you know, the, the the diversity of scenes on the planet is non-trivially small. Right, it, it, it's huge, yeah? So I think anything where you'd have to retrain to run this thing, that's gonna be difficult. So we've got some interesting IP about quite how we do that. Thank you, Paul. Next question I have from the audience. Um, is your solution more about efficiency or more about safety, or is it both? So maybe. Yeah, I, I think it's about both. I think it's about both. I think the, sa the safety aspect of it is really important. Um, obviously, a lot of the systems that we do is now take a safety related. And I, I think if you have 
uh, an autonomous vehicle in a dangerous environment, say if it's mining or something similar. Uh, and then every now and then, um, which is, I believe is currently the case, every now and then it drops out, it works 90% of the time. Uh, and then it drops out when it gets dusty or when there's poor weather or when there's poor light or when you get some reflections of something, then um, that's, that's a safety issue. That's a safety issue. Uh, so I would say, uh, it, foremost it's a safety issue but secondly clearly it's an efficiency issue as well because if your if your port stops every now and then or your mine stops every now and then then it takes some time to get things going so so we have had discussions with customers where uh that yeah their primary aim might be safety but they said also this is actually going to stop us um having regular uh system downtime um uh, and actually in some cases they actually design in the system downtime for example after a blasting operation in a mine where everything's covered in dust and smoke uh and uh, you, you the vehicle sit there waiting for it to clear before they actually start operating again so so both absolutely both yeah, yeah. so you deliver the last 10 percent so to say when other systems fail the 10 percent then it yeah. gets uh, absolutely absolutely those 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 corner cases which actually in mining environments don't become they're they're sort mm -hmm. of like day-to-day -day occurrences uh, we overcome those as well yeah. yes and I think I think on the safety thing there's an independence uh, argument in there as well so there's an independence of sensing like sense in several ways using different modalities vision laser and radar and then also process the data in a different way we've we've worked um, with someone where they thought they knew where they were for a couple of years and they've always been seven meters to the right yeah, because they were, you know, just they were just believing one sensor, and then you know that's a bit scary, right? So the more ways you can answer the question and you get introspective about where am I and what's around me, then almost axiomatically the safer you are. And I think that's such an important point as we start yeah. to come in these systems. Um, you know, yeah. better vehicles are more efficient, more useful, and safer. So you know, uh, I reject any sort of uh, exclusive or in there. It's a massive capitalized and gate. I'd like all of it, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question from the audience. It's a it's a double uh, question. First is how often would you need to remap your environment? Second yeah. part of the question: What other regular maintenance is required, such as cleaning or servicing? Okay. Um, I think it's yeah, I mean, you know, the the, ma the map size is is absolutely minute. So you know, it's it's. Uh, yeah you know a, a few meg per kilometer so absolutely tiny um the mathematics in there is built to expect drastic scene change okay so what it does is it doesn't expect the scene to be similar it looks for the stuff that hasn't changed and that can be fractional so you could have huge scene change and huge vehicles haven't moved and it's just finding a few things that it can anchor on so in that sense it's extremely robust now if the entire thing were to change, I mean, everything to change, then you would remap and that takes a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it really is that quick. You drive, you press a button, there's a web client, it remaps and, and you're good to go. And we have the full tooling for provenance of mapping, which is really important from the safety stuff. So if someone did want to change something, you can see the user that made the change, why they did it, you can back it out, you can revert it as if it were a source control. So we've thought about that, but very, very light touch on that. Very, very light, far less than you would laser and vision, for example. And Phil, very shortly on maintenance, services, servicing, yeah, very, very small amount of maintenance required. Regular cleaning, um, uh, not required unless you actually get a significant buildup of debris on the outside of the road. And we're talking, you know, several centimetres thick. Uh, general dust and dirt doesn't matter. Um, servicing, the current sensor requires servicing once every five years. Um, and in fact, future sensors will not require servicing at all. Um, they have a design life of 10 years and will not require servicing during that period. So again, in, in industrial uh, levels of uh, availability, is what we're aiming for. Yeah. I need to wrap up the session in two minutes. Um, just the last question came in um, where I take the second part is, based on what you've done now the last 20 years, what do you dream of creating in 20 years from now on? Very short forward and very short film, please. Um, I can get very short on the on the on the radar side. We we would like to have radars that that can produce data uh, um, akin to uh, visual data we get from cameras now, but but with all the benefits of radar. Thank you for as much as short, um, like Phil Paul. Yeah, what what he says will easily do that. And if I've learned <laughs> one thing as being an AI leader is that twenty years is such an insane 
to uh, distance to look over. It's like trying to look into side, you know, around a black hole. You, you just don't know. Um, uh, but I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I just can't answer that question because my experience, my data tells me, you don't know because I haven't invented it yet, but these things will be ubiquitous. I'll tell you what we will do is we'll look back and go, it was so not okay to have people driving over people. Yeah, and mm -hmm. reversing into things. And it was so insane when we looked at how we used to build vehicles that were built around a human that was going to be driving all the time, not just on the roads, but everywhere. We're going to go, why did we, why were we stuck on that for about a hundred years? We're going to go, that's clearly nuts. We'll have different ways to make vehicles and, and computing and AI driving vehicles will be everywhere. Thank you, Paul. And thanks um, for this really good session, Paul, Phil. Anybody who's watching this session and you are more interested in Halma, in Navtag or Oxbotica, please reach out to us. We are very happy to get in contact with you. And even more, if you're interested in the solution we presented today, Lab to Life, the Terrence 360, please come back to Phil and Navtag.